So today's agenda, just really quick, I'm just doing very quick uh, introductions and welcome to all of you. Um, and I'll show who we are in just a moment. Um, and we're going to primarily hear today from our friends at the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunities, or LEO, um, and then Catholic Charities of Northern Nevada. And then we will have time. 10 to 15 minutes, hopefully 15 um, team, um, to have questions and answers so you all can just um, ask any questions you have about this process, knowing that there will be opportunity to connect one-on-one -on -one with um, our friends at LEO. So he's here's our team today. So I'm just going to quickly say their names, and they're going to just say hi so you can connect screen little squares to the people that are joining us. So we have Alex from Leo. Hi all. Thanks, Alex. Marie from Northern Catholic Church of Northern Nevada slash the airport today. Hi. There's Marie. And then um, I'm Stephanie Brooke I'm at Ascend. Um, I manage the Ascend Network. I know some of you from my past life at Empath, where I was for almost nine years, and our friends from Catholic Charities of Northern Nevada are actually going to talk about mobility mentoring. So all of the worlds are colliding today, and I'm just thrilled to be here with all of you. And then we have Fred. Hi, I'm Fred. Thanks, Fred. And Jessica. Hello. And then we have Mara. Last Greetings. Time. And Jordan is not listed on the slides, but very important to mention, he makes sure that anything and all things happen. So thank you, Jordan, for being here with us today, too. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here. All right. To set the stage in an Ascend context, I did also just want to make you aware, although knowing all of you who are in this room today, you probably have downloaded, if not fully read this report, um, that we did release a brand new report this month on building evidence. And we had a building evidence and learning action committee that met for 16 months. So the result of their work is what's really featured in this brief. Um, and it publishes a set of recommendations of principles um, that they hope can guide future two-gen learning evaluation and research, which really tees us up beautifully for our conversation with Leo and Catholic Charities to think about how do you have two gen principles in the way that you do evaluation? Why do we do evaluation? How do we merge the worlds of programs and evaluation into a way that really supports whole family well being? And I'm really thrilled to learn alongside of all of you today. And with that, I'm going to hand it to my friend Fred. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We really appreciate it. And we're really grateful to Ascend at the Aspen Institute for hosting this webinar today and appreciate all of you good, busy folks for being here um, for this time with us. Uh, so let me start by telling you a little bit about LEO. LEO is the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunities, which is a bit of a mouthful, which is why we call it LEO. Uh, we are an academic research center that lives within the economics department at the University of Notre Dame. Um, unfortunately, that beautiful image is not the like what I see out my window. Um, I've got a little dank courtyard, but it's a beautiful place to be still. Uh, we were founded in 2012 by two economics professors who were doing a lot of poverty research in their academic work, and frankly, finding that it was just mostly staying in the academic sphere. It would be read by other economists, be published in journals, but otherwise not doing a whole lot. So LEO was created to bring together academics like themselves, service providers like all of you, uh, policymakers, philanthropists, all these good folks with the idea that maybe we were, you know, fighting poverty in our own ways, but sometimes doing it in silos. So if we could come together, we would hope that it might be more effective. Uh, next, please. Um, so here's what we believe at LEO. Um, first, we believe that poverty can be outsmarted and that those organizations on the ground providing frontline services, uh, nonprofits and government agencies like yourselves, um, are best suited to provide the answers that will work. We value subsidiarity, uh, the belief that those closest to an issue are best positioned to address it. So we also believe that the only way to provide families living in poverty with interventions that really work is to build up evidence about the impact that innovative programs are having in the communities. Because this is the real problem. Next, please. As evidence by all the organizations in the Aspen Institute's robust ASCEND network, uh, the reason that we are losing the battle against poverty in this country is not due to a lack of will. It's not due to a lack of good people doing hard work. It's not even due to a lack of money. Um, it's due to a lack of evidence about what actually works to move people out of poverty permanently. We spend a trillion dollars a year 
uh, fighting poverty in this country, but only about 1% of those dollars are put towards evidence-based programs. So we need brave organizations like yours to help us change those numbers. Next, please. Uh, so what do we do? We find innovators like yourselves. Uh, we teach about impact evaluations. We'll even touch on some of the real basics today. My colleague Alex is gonna give you like a couple of slides about RCTs, it's gonna be great. Uh, we work closely with partners through a collaborative process to design a study that is on the one hand really rigorous and on the other hand fits within the context of the work that they're already doing to serve their communities. Uh, then we learn and we iterate together, sharing our findings with the broader community to scale and create greater change. Next, please. Uh, so we've been doing this for a while now. Uh, we are bumping up close to 100 projects with organizations like yours all around the country. Um, a prime example of one of our all-stars partners has kindly joined us here today, which we're so grateful for. Uh, so rather than me giving you like secondhand account about a couple of my favorite partners and the projects they're running, I'm going to happily hand things over to Marie so that she can tell you about uh, Catholic Charities Northern Nevada and the good work that they are doing. Marie? Thank you, Fred, and thank you, Stephanie, for having us. We're incredibly grateful to get to talk a little bit about Catholic Charities of Northern Nevada. So just by way of a little context of how, kind of who we are and how we came to be a partner with Leo, um, our Catholic Charities, like many, has been around about 80 years. The base of our services has always been in those you know, emergency service space. So, you know, food, shelter, clothing, um, those, what we sort of typically think of as a Catholic charities. Our board and our staff about five years ago was really bold enough to say, what could we do to interrupt generational poverty in our community? And from there, we started on our Leo journey. And just for some additional context about our Catholic charities is a mid-sized Catholic charities. We have about a $12 million budget. We have about 185 people who work in our agency, and we have eight separate business lines um, that serve people, but only one that is really looking at that breaking that cycle for center, second generation poverty. So it's really been a great journey. So next, I don't know if I have two slides in this part or not, because I can only see one slide at a time. All right, so I'm turning it over to Jessica. And Jessica, you can talk. Jessica is the director of our Elevating Families program. So I'll turn it over to Jess. And Jess, why don't you talk a little bit about our LEO project? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about our program, Elevating Families. We are an economic mobility mentoring program, and we're focused on improving outcomes for parents and in turn, their children. Next, please. So how does Elevating Families work? We have participants that are between the ages of 18 and 55 years of age and who have to have a child that is 13 years or younger. And the reason for this is because we are looking to see the effects of a child as their parent goes through our Elevating Families program. So we have parent participants that have children that are like 18, 16, and a six-year-old, and that qualifies them to be part of our program. They meet with their highly trained empath mobility mentor for at least six months, but it can, we work with parent participants for up to two years. It's really rewarding to see the trajectory and to be there through the highs and lows of our participants' experience. Um, participants complete the empath bridge to self-sufficiency. It says sustainability as well. Um, it is the next, the, the one what by the lock talks about what we focus on. It has five pillars and three sub pillars. I think of the bridge to self-sufficiency as a holistic approach to looking at our participants' um, lives to circle where they're at, but not to leave them there. Um, and we see trajectory on that bridge as we work with our parent participants for the up to two years. Based on where they see themselves on the bridge to self-sufficiency, we create goal action plans with our participants following SMART criteria, making sure that they're time-bound, measurable, um, attainable, that these goals are something that our parent participant feels confident achieving. Um, that's what we work on in general, but we also offer a slew of other um, 
parts of our program. Participants, they can attend parenting classes, financial literacy classes, certificate programs. We have a nutritionist that comes in and helps to um, inform our parent participants of healthy eating, along with using our client choice pantry, which is located right into our building. Um, as well as we have behavioral health interns who work with our parent participants on the mental health pillar of the bridge to self-sufficiency. Participants, they earn incentives that they identify with their mobility mentor during the goal action plan process. They range from gift cards to local attractions, restaurants, Starbucks, um, as well as activities around our area. What I like the most when I'm doing a bridge to self-sufficiency and a goal action plan is the participant recognition because we're really trying to change the way our participants view themselves, unconditional positive regard and rewarding themselves when they create, when they complete an action step because only they know how hard it was to complete those steps. At the end of our program, Participants have increased their earning capacity and have achieved self-sufficiency across key areas. And one new unique aspect of our program is we have something called small stability stipends. It's a mouthful. Um, but they can, for our parent participants, for up to six months' time at their discretion, um, can access $300 a month that we put towards rental assistance, utility assistance, child care. And the reason for that is so that they can start to focus on other necessities. So the debt and savings pillar, um, fixing their car, getting further in their education, and really learning how to build up a savings account. And that's a brief overview of what we do, certainly not until of everything. Next. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that. And Maria, I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm happy to give just a quick overview of uh, what the broader like research world looks like at LEO. I'm sure that some of you have programs that look in some ways similar to Elevating Families and others that are totally different. So I'd like to talk about just more broadly what uh, the different types of research projects that LEO is interested in. Uh, next, please. So we really are interested in a wide variety of anti-poverty work, um, including everything you see listed here, um, housing and homelessness, to health, to education, to employment, to self-sufficiency. And we also recognize that oftentimes these are very closely interrelated. And so a project may not focus so narrowly on one of those topics. We have a number of projects that hit on any number of them or all of them in some cases. Uh, next, please. So um, we have some also specific focus areas for our upcoming cohort that we are just starting vetting for right now. Um, our upcoming cohort, uh, these particular focus areas include at least a couple of which I think this is like the perfect group for us to be talking to. So I really appreciate Stephanie and Jordan for putting all of you together today in this room with us. Uh, in particular, the Strengthening Families Research Initiative is actually a pillar of Notre Dame's larger university-wide poverty initiative. This is something that the entire university, not just LEO, not just the economics department, is focused on right now, which is why we're particularly happy to be talking with a bunch of organizations that center the two-gen approach in their work. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to hand this over to Alex, who is going to talk a little bit about how randomized control trials actually work, what they look like here at LEO. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Um, so just for some context, as Fred previously mentioned, there's kind of a lack of evidence in the fight against poverty, especially as research is applied. So we need rigorous evidence to figure out which programs are really effective and which ones might need modification. So you might then be led to the question, well, how is rigorous evidence generated? And the general answer we have for that at LEO is randomized controlled trials, or RCTs. These are kind of the gold standard within economics and public policy for conducting evaluations of sort of these types of interventions. So there's a lot of complexities to these, but I think it's good to just know the guiding principle, which is relatively simple. We want to make apples to apples comparisons. So... For us to be able to tell whether an intervention is effective or not, we need there to be no differences aside from receipt of the intervention between those who receive it and those who don't. 
So I think the next slide does a really great job of illustrating this principle. So if we randomly assign in a lottery who receives the treatment and who receives control, then in that case, it will be that the only difference between these two groups is that they receive treatment and control. So we're making an apples to apples comparison. So that's sort of the guiding principle of a randomized controlled trial. Um, the way they're generally applied in LEO is shown in this next slide. So the way this generally works is that we will recruit um, people who are eligible for the study from the general population. We'll randomize them. Those in control will be given sort of standard services at an organization rather than the intervention that the study is targeting. And those in treatment will be offered this intervention. Whether they decide to take up the intervention or not is their own decision. But following that, after a couple of years, we'll probably collect outcomes and then run an analysis on this. And this is how we sort of generate the evidence for these programs. And if you all have any questions about how RCTs work, I'd be more than happy to answer them at the conclusion of these slides. Yeah. Thanks so much, Alex. Really appreciate that. That's great. Um, so I would imagine some of you at least are thinking, uh, that sounds hard. That sounds complicated. Um, and you are absolutely right about that. You would be right to think that. Um, so you might ask, why do organizations like yours choose to do the hard thing and partner with Leo to run an impact evaluation? So I'll give you like our quick little sales pitch here. Um, first, and I think most importantly, is that impact really does start with knowing. You want to know if you are making a difference in your community. And the more that we know, the better the impact that we can make for those people that we serve. Um, second, and this is a big one that people like to hear, our research is free. Um, that's not the case for all uh, organizations that offer research to organizations like yours. Uh, we will provide this research opportunity at no cost to you, to our partners. Um, on the other end of this, if you have more evidence, we have found that that will equal more money for organizations that work with us. Um, I'm sure that some of you have probably already felt this, that there's a shift in the philanthropic community that's happening right now to have a real focus on impact, on impact and on outcomes rather than just outputs. Um, funders are asking for you know, real proof of impact. And this work that we do together will be that proof, which will allow you to tell your story that much more effectively. Um, and to that end, like our research is third party validation of your work. I'm sure that a lot of you already do things that like internally validate the work that you're doing. Otherwise you wouldn't be continuing with that work. But this is one thing that you can go to, you know, and say Notre Dame says that we're doing amazing work. That's a little bit different than you saying we believe we're doing really good work. Um, and so this will continue to validate and build credibility around the work that you're doing and hopefully lead to greater systems change, not just for yourself, but for other organizations. Um, so that's my pitch, but I'm uh, obviously a bit biased. Uh, so let me pass it back to Marie so that she can tell you a bit about the big questions that Catholic Charities Northern Nevada was asking and why they made the hard choice to seek out an impact evaluation and partner with Leo. Thank you. So as I mentioned, this has been a multi-year process that really started with a, a, an adoption of a new vision statement for our agency sort of five years prior to when we really launched into our, um, our whole process with Leo. And as we were looking at internally, how do we wanna create you know, a program that's gonna address poverty in our community. We, much like you were saying, Fred, we didn't want to do that independent of measurable outcomes. So uh, for us, our program was actually developed in lockstep with our LEO research team. We had a big idea. We had a million conversations. We had a variety of different opportunities and models that we were looking at. And we said, okay, let's look at what is the research question that we want to answer what strategies do we think is going to drive us in that factor? And what research partner is going to get us there? Um, and so this is just the research question that we landed on. Um, but again, it was a multi-month process before we really got down to something so succinct, because um, it's such a complicated and really engaging and fun process, I have to say. So, you know, our question is, does economic mobility mentoring implemented with a focus on the well-being of both parents and their children improve outcomes for parents and children? And it sounds so simple when you read it, but the level of conversation that got us to this space, um, I think is one of the things that um, makes our partnership so incredibly strong with Leo. 
Um, so we're going to talk more about it in a few slides, but that's just a little bit of context for how we got to this seemingly easy research question. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Marie. That's great. Yes. So I, I, that feeds perfectly into what I'm going to talk about, which is what the partnership process looks like. And it can look a little bit different for every organization, um, but we do have like an overarching uh, set of principles that we use when we're trying to find the next Catholic Charities Northern Nevada to partner with us and come up with a project for them. Uh, next, please. So first off, and this is uh, a little bit different than maybe how some researchers work, but we start with looking for the right partner. Um, we don't, we have a bunch of brilliant economists here in the building and they have big ideas, but we don't try to take those ideas and impose them on a partner. We try to find a partner that we believe will be a strong partner and will be able to work with us to develop a good research idea and then go from there. So what makes someone a good partner to be a Leo, to become uh, a Leo research, part of a, the next Leo uh, cohort? A first is that they really have to believe in the people they serve. The program needs to reflect um, that they are informed by the, the lived realities of the people who receive the services that they provide. Um, they, we need to, they need to demonstrate that they actively prioritize human dignity and that they see their clients as real people who have strengths and who uh, have gifts to offer. Um, second, we're looking for organizations that have stable and committed leadership. This is important for, as Marie talked about, it's a long process and you wanna make sure that you have someone in leadership who believes in research and can guide the ship throughout this long process. So in addition to that, we're looking for someone who is adaptable and creative, who can rally staff when things get tough, who can manage through transitions and who and who can navigate you know, the often necessary culture change that is required to instill uh, belief in the research that you are doing. Um, third, we're looking for an organization that has the grit that rigorous research requires. Um, it's going to be hard. There are going to be road bumps. And so we look for organizations that won't just throw up their hands the first time things get a little bit tricky, but that will work with us to find um, innovative solutions to move forward with the project and make sure that things uh, continue forward. Um, and finally, we need an organization that really does nurture a culture of learning. Um, you have to be a little bit comfortable with risk. Because as strongly as you believe in your project and the work that you're doing, um, having an impact evaluation will demonstrate the true impact of that, whether it is exactly what you believe it to be or whether it's something different. Um, so we need an organization that really believes in that uh, either direction. And so then next, we're looking for the right partner with that right project. Next, please. So what does the right project look like? Um, this is something that, as Marie talked about, we work through with organizations once we find someone who we think will be the right partner, and this is very interrelated. Uh, so first, we need a well-defined intervention that has potential for scale and replication. Um, the example that we give here is if just because Catholic Charities Northern Nevada has amazing people like Marie and Jessica in charge, they are not scalable. They are not replicable, right? We need their program that can be scaled and replicated if it's being proven to be effective. Um, second, we need something that advances collective learning. There are some things in this area that we know to be true, and then we have a lot of big outstanding questions. We're looking to try to answer those big outstanding questions. Uh, we need a project that incorporates research design into day-to-day -day operations. Uh, by this, mean, we mean that we would not want to drastically change the work that you're doing in order to put research on top of it. That is not ever our goal. We want to be able to seamlessly work it into the work that you are already doing in your community. Um, we need to identify outcomes that are important for us to measure. That's key to any sort of research project. Um, and we need to be able to use a comparison group, as Alex laid out there, to pinpoint impact. Um, when running an RCT, that is a very important piece of this. So we need an organization that can articulate what the comparison group will get and then be willing to randomize into intervention and control groups. Next, please. The next thing that we look for in organizations are three key people to be involved from the research team on the organization. Um, so the first person is a decision maker. This is uh, usually a leader within the organization, someone who can make decisions, uh, as obvious by the name, um, allocate resources, manage priorities for the project, do all those things that decision makers do. Um, the other really important role of the decision maker is to create culture and buy-in for research throughout the rest of the organization. It's really important that the entire team, not just the leadership, 
understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, and why it drives forward the mission of the organization. Uh, research will get hard, and when it does, we need the team to be prepared. Uh, the next person, next slide, please, that we ask each organ organization to identify is their champion. Uh, so the champion is really our main point of contact throughout the entire process of working with an organization. Uh, the champion is usually someone who is closer to the program we are evaluating. They know all the ins and outs of the program, how enrollment works, all of those things. Uh, this person attends all of the research design calls and is our connector with the organization. Uh, so they're responsible for things like, uh, we're talking about outcomes and I need to know that the decision maker needs to speak into that conversation, or I need to pull in a different person from the team who can provide detail on this specific aspect of the program. Um, they don't need to know all the answers, but they need to be able to loop in the right people at the right time. And then our last person, which is actually a new role, um, next slide, please, is the recruiter. Uh, so this cohort that just we just recently launched is the first time that we have had a designated recruiter um, on the team. And the reason that we have added this third role is that we've identified that the biggest reason projects fail is due to numbers, um, namely recruitment and take up, the things that Alex laid out previously. Um, in addition to creating this new role, uh, Leo has made investments of our own to address these numbers challenges, namely contract contracting with an innovative marketing organization called Joy Brand Creative. Um, the recruiter is responsible for representing the organization in this partnership with Joy Brand and will receive intensive and valuable training uh, support from Joy Brand's marketing experts. The recruiter, like quote unquote, owns the recruitment function, but like the champion, this doesn't mean that they have to do everything. Uh, they just need to be able to make sure that the right voices are involved in order to execute on the strategy effectively. So that's kind of the big overview of how we're what we're looking for in partners and how we think about these things. Uh, now that you have an idea of what we're looking for, um, I'm gonna hand it off to Mara who can walk you through how we find the next Catholic Charities in Northern Nevada and what you could expect from collaborating with Leo. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, got it. Thanks. Thanks, Fred. So we are on the way, way, way left right now. And we're gonna start with a quick overview of how we find new organizations to work with Leo. So once we get into formal vetting, if you decide this is something you're interested in, we would start with a quick conversation. And um, this slide is gonna be at the beginning of every process to make sure that everyone is on track and we're on the same page. We're gonna hold this series of structured conversations during which we'll get into more detail about how Leo works. Also more detail about how you work so that we can learn all about your organization and help each other think through the high level details of a potential project. These are individual meetings via Zoom between your organization and our project development team, Fred and I and our colleagues. And we'll talk through things like what particular program you might want to study, what outcomes you're most interested in measuring, identifying the pathway to randomization, and any administrative data we'll need to access to measure, etc. Now, you might notice between stage two and stage three, there's a little bit of a longer break, and that's when you're going to submit the details of your project for feedback from our research faculty. One of the dedicated economists on our staff who's had ex academic expertise in the work that you do will provide some feedback. And then we will share that back with you. And finally, the organizations that reach stage four and demonstrate that high potential will be invited to campus, to Notre Dame's campus, for a discovery day to present your project directly to the LEO leadership and our research faculty. This is going to be a 24-hour event. There's time to dig in on specifics and see if we really are a good fit. Following that discovery day, select organizations will be invited to join us with our next research cohort. So that's the small piece. Next slide, please. And then we're going to go through the whole uh, timeline for organizations um, following Discovery Day. There's a, if you can't make it in October, there's a second chance in February. But following that uh, second chance, that Discovery Day, we'll finalize the cohort and the organizations that have been accepted will be invited back to Notre Dame for a two and a half day workshop, which we creatively named Workshop One because it's first. We will use that time together to go through all of the ins and outs of impact evaluation and provide you with the tools to develop the culture and the capacity that Alex and Fred have mentioned. 
most importantly, workshop one is when you're going to be paired with your research team and you'll hold your first formal research design sessions, uh, which you'll do together in person. After workshop one, our cohort partners spend 16 weeks finalizing their research design. This uh, process, as Marie said, will get you to that question and uh, conducted over weekly calls uh, during which you will be shepherded through this process that Marie mentioned. It's going to take on many components of the research manageable piece by manageable piece building over time. Following that design, we're going to bring the cohort back together virtually for a second workshop. This workshop, all of the organizations will present their completed research designs to their fellow cohort partners, to the broader LEO team, to faculty affiliates, and um, those from other universities as well as Notre Dame, and to potential funders and interested policymakers. The goal of this workshop will be to celebrate the hard work and create as much exposure as possible. Phew, you're done, right? You got the study launched? Not yet. Next slide, please. Now we get to dig in to the research. So we've done um, the vetting. We've talked a little bit about that exploratory process, and it might sound like a lot, but again, we're going to build it and be with you on every step. And that is just the early stages. So we will initiate the research design. We will then start enrolling the first study participants and then um, analyzing the results as they start to come in. Our research ops teams and lovely people like Alex, um, who with Marie and Jessica can talk a little bit more specifically about how all this works, um, will be partnering with you. And then once we have those results, we're sharing our dedicated policy and impact team is going to kick it into high gear, ensuring that the findings are shared far and wide. So other service providers, academics, policymakers, philanthropists, um, and the public at large can learn from the research that we've been doing and the great work that you've been doing. There's a lot of detail missing here, but rather than trying to just describe all of the hypotheticals in each uh, piece, I'm going to pass it back to Marie so that she and Jessica can tell you a little bit more about where they are in the process, what this has been like for them, and a little bit about Catholic Charity Northern Nevada's experience working with Leo. So I'm probably Leo's biggest champion. So the process has been incredible. And Jess is going to jump in here and talk a little bit about it too. So in terms of the role, I'm the CEO of Catholic Charities and I've been the decision maker. So this has really been like my driving force um, from the get-go. And Jessica is our champion. Um, and then we do have a recruiter. We were part of the cohort that had a recruiter. So um, Jennifer is our recruiter. Uh, which has been fantastic. So the three of us have literally met with our research design team every single week for almost two years now. And it is such an incredible scaffolded, gentle process um, where we've had, we've worked with Alex, who's phenomenal. We worked with Eileen, who is um, not with Notre Dame anymore, and John. And they literally break everything down. It's so clear. It's so easy to understand. It's always a dialogue. And you, the part that is so honoring about it is it is meant to strengthen a program, not to create a program that is a research program. It's we are going to change the lives of families in our community. And we all share that commitment. And so how this process has unfolded into underlaying the research um, has been really incredible and it's been hard. It's been rewarding um, just getting to the point where you launch. Um, that workshop too is a riot because it's a little bit like being on Shark Tank, not going to lie, in front of like 60 people. Um, but it's, I can't encourage people enough to work with the incredible team at Leo. Uh, because it's just been it's been life changing for our staff and also for the people who we're serving who will benefit from this. So I'm going to let Jess talk a little bit more about her experience as a program director, and then we could talk a little bit about our status and then some of those lessons learned. And then I think when we get to Q and A, we'll really be able to, um, you know, hopefully address some of those things that are like, well, what about this? So so Jess, jump in there. Yeah. Um, so as my job as the champion, I'm. I'm really the boots on the ground and I am a program director as well as a mobility mentor. So I really am immersed in this project as much as possible. And I have been with it from the start. And I think the biggest, my biggest takeaway is being part of this research study 
it encourages me to look at our program differently every day. I'm looking through it, not only through a social worker's analysis, a program director, but now the research analysis of it. And I'm really passionate about research and making sure that our program is evidence-based and really seeing the effects. Just like uh, Mara was saying and Fred, I know how impactful we are. I feel it every single day. Every day I walk out of here knowing I've done something in the community to better the community as well as my team. But I'm really excited to see the the basis of it, the data, and really get those numbers to see how effective we are. That way we can really show how great of a program we have. During the meeting when we went to Notre Dame, I'm always going to get the quote wrong. But they said um, something like, without data, it's just a story, right? It's just a story. So once you get the data, once you get the research, you really actually have the backing to show how effective your program is. And that's something that I continue to remind myself and my staff. Lessons learned. I will be completely honest and transparent. The randomization, it's, it's a new way of looking at things. And I want to help everybody. And that I know how effective our program is. And I believe that we can change the lives of every individual who is interested in starting that process with us. So that is something that I struggle with, um, but I have a very supportive staff, a very supportive leadership. And Leo is very supportive and they understand when I come to them on the weekly meetings and I, I vent a little bit or I'll just share what's going on here. And they really listen with empathy and understanding and try to help me the best that they can during that. And it's something we're rolling with. We've been going on our research project now for since October, that's the official launch. And so with each randomization, it gets easier. <laughs> And we take it each, uh, the 15th of every month, we randomize that, we randomize. So the 15th of every month, we support each other. And we know that just because they're randomized, randomized not into our program, they will get help from Catholic charities. It's not just, you're not into elevating families, we're not gonna help you at all. Um, so that's another way that I ease my mind <laughs> during everything. But I think it's just the support we get um, from Leo and leadership is essential to our success as a program. Excellent. So some other research lessons learned for us. Um, one, the process of the design is, as I mentioned, this incredibly supportive, wonderful experience, but the real work really does start the day you launch. And the work, there's the program that goes on, which Jessica runs and does a phenomenal job, but the, in terms of being the decision maker, the work in helping getting the data sharing agreements, the work that had to go into designing a database to track our data, um, the work that we are doing at our state level in fundraising and, um, and making sure that we, it's about a $2.4 million commitment to our agency above our standard operating budget to operate elevating families. Um, and because of the, it, we know we have to serve so many people in such a short period of time. Um, so we had to look at a different budget for this program. Um, so I think as we're looking at potential partners or we're asking questions, the recruitment is incredibly challenging giving our model. And we were one of the pilots uh, programs to work with Joy Brand. And I honestly don't think we could be doing what we're doing if we hadn't had the Joy Brand pieces that are helping us connect with potential clients because it uses a lot of specialized software. It uses AI, you know, it's just where there's text message threads that go out and we're able to connect with people in different ways. So I think, you know, we're again, we're talking about, you know, the, the broader part of this, the investment of time beyond just designing a study and operating a program is vast. Um, and do I think it's worth it? 100%. It was why I wanted to do this from day one when I said I want to do something in this space. I want to do it as a full-blown research study because it's an investment. It's an investment of time. It's an investment of money. And if, if our strategy doesn't work to answer our research question, then I want to know what does. So then we'll do another research study and we'll try a different method. So um, it's really this very, I just want to be really candid in the level of commitment. It's 
far beyond just, hey, we're going to design a research study and we're going to launch it. And I wanted to touch on what Jessica said too, the emotional impact on my incredible staff is real because when you know that 50% of the people who walk through the door complete our intense survey that is very, very in-depth, they are only going to be routed into Catholic Charities' usual care, which, thank goodness for Catholic Charities, we have really robust usual care, but, and then the other half will get this specialized one-on-one -on -one treatment. It's very emotional, and so we do wrap a lot of um, additional support around our staff, it's especially during randomization, um, because it's hard. They form connections with people that they will never see again. Um, so I, there is an emotional component to doing something where um, you know the bigger picture outcomes are gonna be absolutely worth the short-term pain, uh, but it's, it's really a complex process and, and it's a long-term process. Like we're in this for you know three to five years and you gotta hit your numbers and you gotta stay on top of it all the time. And that's where I go back, like Leo is amazing. Those calls, which we still have with John and Alex, like they are the backbone of making sure we're doing this well and that we're doing it with you know integrity and the ability to make sure that we're gonna we're gonna cross that finish line in a few years. And the other thing is is I've also reached out and talked to some of the other Leo participants and that's been invaluable to us to learn like where are they in their study, what's happening with that and what what were some of their lessons learned and we've been able to make changes at the beginning of our study. Um, especially like reaching out and supporting our staff because their staff experienced that same like emotional trauma of randomization. Um, so we were able to be more proactive. So I think those are some other valuable lessons learned. But um, so that's some high level. I'll let you guys, I'll shoot it back over to you a bit, see if there's, I know we're coming into Q&A. So happy to talk about any of those things. Um, thank you so much, Marie. I really appreciate that. And I, I appreciate both of you, Marie and Jessica, talking about both, you know, the benefits that you've seen and the challenges that you've seen, because it's very real and we want to uh, potential partners to go in with open eyes. So we really appreciate that. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. You can actually just go through this next steps one. Perfect. All right. So um, I want to get to the Q&A. So I just want to put out our simple ask here. This is, it is quite simple. Um, me and my team, we are always looking for organizations that we like to call poverty's fiercest adversaries. Um, and as a pillar of Notre Dame's, universe, Notre Dame's uh, university-wide poverty initiative, we are particularly interested in working with organizations like yours that are focused on working with the whole family to help end generational poverty. So if you're interested, we would love to schedule a time to talk with you one-on-one -on -one and learn more about what you do. Um, if you could just go to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, great. So this is, uh, yeah, if you could just, here we go, perfect. Um, here is how you can do this. There's a quick link here, I'm gonna put it in the chat. I would like to give um, the last word to Marie and Jessica before we go on, just maybe a little bit of encouragement to click on that link. If you can click on that link, you can have 20 minutes scheduled with me and Mara next week. Like we'll chat with you, we're excited for it. Um, and then we can decide together whether it makes sense to continue the conversation from there. Thanks very much, really appreciate your having us today. Amazing. Jessica, Emery, I want you to make sure that you have concluding thoughts. I'm going to take our slides now and give people some time to bring their um, cameras on if they're able to, to join in the conversation. And then you can share your concluding thoughts as people think through their questions. I have many, but I want to give other people the space. So just thank you all so much for that presentation. I learned a lot um, and really enjoyed listening and learning. So concluding thoughts, Marie or Jessica. I can say it too. Do it. It will absolutely be worth it. Go, so Jess. <laughs> if nothing else, it changes your perspective on your program and it helps you become more insightful of what you can and can't do. And it keeps me on my toes every day. <laughs> That really resonated with me, Jessica, when you were um, when you first started talking and you said it really shifted the way you thought about your programming and that it helped you really think about what you're doing, why you're doing it, how to continuously make it better. Um, I really heard that. And one of the things I thought about um, after I had said it, we have to have everything approved by the IRB. So we're continuously checking our program and formalizing 
thing. So if that's why I say like, if nothing else, you'll learn <laughs> what you are and aren't doing right and how to make your program better um, from so many aspects. <laughs> More friends. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so if you have questions, please feel free to put it in the chat or just unmute yourself. We're a small group. Hi, friends that I know. Um, I have questions, but I'm going to give you all a chance to ask yours. I'll ask a question. I think I already know the answer, but I'll ask it anyway, hoping that you give me a different answer. Um <laughs> On the RCT requirement and uh, randomization, how wedded to you are that? Would you consider some quasi experimental design or propensity score matching or something else? We are at school. And so the thinking of coming up with a pool of people who would be large enough to cre create a control group, um, it just it feels not possible. Um, so just wondering if you're interested or able to think about other research design. Yeah, I can start with that. And then Alex, I might ask you to like jump in at the end here as well, if that's okay. Yeah. So um, we lead with RCTs and that's how we vet is that what's, is what we look for. But we have actually um, at the behest of our research faculty who are very interested in other sorts of research designs as well. Um, as part of a new process that we've developed where as Mara laid out, we get uh, feedback earlier on in the process from a research faculty member who is specialized in a specific field. So in education in your uh, particular instance, um, part of the information that we ask you to provide is for our research to do our research faculty to also do an assessment for non RCT studies. So if we ask for the information that um, they will then be able to look and see, is there some sort of quasi experimental study here? Is there some sort of like historical study that we could do with this in, with this organization if an RCT is not possible? And we have in our portfolio um, a number of non-RCT studies that are at various stages of development as well. Alex, can you talk a little bit about this? Do you mind? Yeah, I can. Um, I'm actually on two. Um, I'm on one quasi-experimental study and one retrospective study. So I'm working on that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I've heard the breakdown within Leo's that it's about 80 to 90% RCTs and 20 to 10% quasi-experimental or retrospective. So there definitely is a space for that here, and the researchers seem to really enjoy those as well. So you'll get full support if that's sort of the route that you guys go with. I'm so glad I asked this question. Thank you. That's helpful information. Can I ask a follow-up question to that, um, which is, is that still then like one of the cohorts that does like the discovery day? Like that's still the same Yep. They still come through the cohort process in the same way. Um, the uh, We do have some non-cohort projects that depending on how it's brought to us and the timing, if there are other parameters involved, including like funding mechanisms where things need to start enrolling at certain times, it may be done outside of the cohort process, but we can bring in um, non-RCT RCT projects through the cohort process as well so that they have that same engagement with their uh, fellow organizations. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and Alex, I don't know if you're about to answer some good questions that were happening in the chat. You're on it. Yeah, I just saw it. Um, number of years from beginning to end. Yeah. So to answer the first question from Jimmy, that varies greatly and it depends on sort of the intervention that we're studying. But I would say in terms of enrollment, the usual time to completion is two to three years with maybe a fourth year as well. But the other thing that's built into that is that we have to have wait time to collect outcomes. Otherwise, you might be catching people's data when they're sort of during the program, they're taking time to do that program rather than searching for, say, a new job in the industry they just learned how to work in. So it takes time for the study to be completed, but the enrollment period is usually much shorter, which is sort of the most challenging part for um, the organizations we partner with. Uh, John, I see you had a question as well. Can you use a waitlist control group approach? Um, I have not worked on any projects that take that approach. However, I know some of my colleagues have. So I do know of those existing at Leo. Yes. Share with our leadership. Uh, I think that might be a question for Fred there. 
what she just yep, answered. I did the drive there. There you go. That I will make sure that the two pager. I hope that that's okay. Um, but I will make sure that anyone with this link, it's a, um, a Google Drive document, but I've just made it public. So anyone who clicks on this should be able to take that and download it um, and be able to share it with anyone you like. Please share it freely. And I'll Thank I'll you. include that. I was going to ask you for that too, Ashley. Of course, you asked a question that I was thinking too. I I'll include that in the follow up too to the larger network with the recording because okay. that's great. Thank you so much. Um, does anybody have questions for our wonderful partners at Catholic Charities Northern Nevada? I'm grateful for all the questions to Leo. I'm hoping that many of you will click on that little link and schedule time to chat with us so that we can answer those questions one on one. But this might be a unique opportunity for you to talk to one of our partners who is in the middle of a uh, project with us. So I'm curious if you have any questions for our wonderful partners who joined us today. I'll ask a question. Um, thanks for sharing about your both the work you do and the study. It sounds so interesting. Were you able to um, meet the capacity demands of the project with your existing staff, or did you need to hire additional folks to fill those roles? So we had some key staff that we were able to allocate into that, but based upon our research design, um, we will ultimately have 15 new hires for this particular project over the course of the study so that we can maintain the ratio of mobility mentors to program participants. Um, and that, because we know we have to serve a minimum of 600 individuals, 30 in treatment and treatment control to reach the power calculation. So it'll be statistically significant. So it did impact our you know, from our initial idea of like, okay, this is a program that might have five or six staff. Ultimately, I'm going to need about 18 staff to run the program as a whole. And it's tiered. So every time, you know, we hit 30 new program participants, then I need another new economic mobility mentor. So we had this very complex Excel chart that was over three years looking at how many people were randomized by month, how many staff we would have to come in the when you know who be leading the workshops and then the recruitment piece we actually determined that we needed to have two full-time staff who did nothing but work on recruitment um because it's a very it's a it's a time intensive process on our model for but from the first i might be interested in participating from a parent side through the first initial meeting having them complete a survey um, and then before they even get to the handoff with their actual mobility mentor. So we had, as I said, like our agency had committed to creating a program like this. So we were going to move in that direction, but it is definitely much larger, much faster than it would have been if we just said, hey, we're gonna start a program um, saying, hey, we're gonna do this program and we're gonna overlay all these very specific outcomes that have to be measured and that, you know, the first participant has to have the same experience as the 300th participant. And so that really required a, a vast difference in structure. Thanks. Sorry, and I think it might be an important point of con uh, context there as well, Marie. Um, so elevating families, was that, it was a pre, it was, was or was not a pre-existing program at CCNM? It was not, it was evolving. Okay. at the time that we decided to create this to this level. So we were going to do something in this space. We were kind of designing our own model. Um, we were, Jessica was you know, starting to work and build a team because we knew we wanted to do something in the space of serving families specifically, but it wasn't until we got connected with Leo in our initial sort of cohort connection that we actually ended up adopting the full empath model um and so that's when it really kind of evolved and changed over time so it was it was a very fledgling program for us at the time jimmy did that answer your question too which was like simultaneous you and alex on the same page awesome yeah thanks so much that was great other i mean i have questions did your staff marie and jessica did your staff get a training on 
like RCTs or like understanding what this process was from Leo or anyone? Like, how was that handled? Yes. So this is where I think Leo is amazing. And Jess can speak to this too. So when we, there's initial sort of meetings that we went through that started to design that, but really that workshop one was so incredibly valuable. So we'd already had some one-on-one calls that we were starting to talk and rough things out, but then when we got to workshop one, and I know the process is a little bit different now than when we went through, but when we were all together in that workshop one, not only did we get a lot of really great training, and I recognize some of the slides that were shown today from that, but they also did a lot of role playing, which was great. Like, hey, if you have a board member who's gonna resist, how are you going to address, like, what do you mean you're only serving 50% of the people who are qualified? So we sat there in front of the whole group and all of us had to get up and role play, or we had to role play, like, how are you gonna roll this out to your agency or your staff where there are gonna be staff members? And Jessica's experienced this actually a lot and she could speak to it, where there might be staff that's like, hey, wait a minute, I don't really, that are in totally unrelated programs. Like, why is this getting all the attention? Or why do we have to follow these roles? So Leo, held our hand through that the whole way. So, and Jess, you want to speak a little bit more to that? I know we kind of do a lot of talking, but Jess has really walked that walk. Yeah, I, Marie had a whole agency meeting. We met with everybody in the agency that's direct service staff to talk about elevating families in the research study. And then, <clears throat> I don't know if you figured this out, but I'm, I'm a pretty transparent person. So I talk to my staff regularly about everything. So when I came back from cohort, from the meeting, I told them everything. Like we scheduled three hours for me to tell them everything I learned and why we're doing a research study. Um, the, some of my team members I've worked with for three years. So they've been on a journey with me through Catholic Charities and they're adaptable and flexible. All of those things that Fred discussed looking for in a partner, that's what I look for in terms of staff and my team, because we, we have to adapt to the needs of Catholic Charities as well as to our participants. And then when we interview people, I am for mobility mentors, that's what I tell them, that we're doing a research study. And these are the pros. These are some of the things that we face. I get their feelings about it um, on a consistent basis, just to make sure that we're all checking in and on the same page. And, and then we had to do the one IRP and done. training. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's no joke too. But it's not a one and done. Like we did this initially, but then Jessica just did another agency-wide training um, that her staff did. And then I continually do board education or we do donor education. So it is not a one and done, by the way, to keep people at an agency wide engaged. Um, and then, yeah, the ethics training for the, um, the review board or to make sure that you're you know, maintaining the ability to actually run a research study, that is no joke training. Um, it's very intense. There's tests with every module. Like I have all the dissertation on my PhD and I was like, wow, this is really serious. It's so, a special place. Yeah. So there's <laughs> a lot, there. but with so much great support, right? Like it's yeah. not, it shouldn't be intimidating, but you don't also have to wonder like, I hope I don't make a big mistake and do something wrong. Leo's got your back. They're going to make sure you're well prepared. Yeah. And that yeah, it keeps us actually, in more yeah, right. of best practices. Like it makes us stay in our lane and continue to assess our program and make sure that we're not being misleading or anything like that. So. Absolutely. One of the things that we've actually gotten a little bit better at, even I think Marie and Jessica, is that all of our new cohort partners, starting with our most recent workshop one, are sent home with a toolkit that they're that they oh, bring nice. back to their organizations, where it's basically workshop one becomes kind of a train the trainers type situation, oh, where then the things that we do with you when we bring the champion and the decision maker and recruiter to campus. They can go back and do that with their staffs, those exact same type of activities. So that's, that's really cool. fantastic. Well, we are at time, but I want to just concluding that I just think that you can just hear reiterate, learn, and what you're describing, Marie and Jessica, that's like what all of us do in programs all the time. It's not just because of research, right? We're we're always needing to train our staff over and over again, not negatively, but just like to reiterate concepts. So this is everyone that I know in this room is familiar with this already. So just thank you all so much for your time, your like willingness to join us. Um, this was recorded. We'll send out follow-up. We'll send links so that you can link up with Notre Dame, Leo, and um, please stay in touch. It's great to see you all. So thank you so much.